I have <laughs> Paul Craddock with us to talk about his uh, new book, which is exploring the history of transplantation in society, back beyond the clever technological things that happened in the last century, as often the case, back into previous times when um, people clever people as clever as us for sure we're trying to deal with medical emergencies paul's been associated with the, the division of surgery and, and the department and the transplant service at the royal free for, for a number of years and some of you will have seen him talk at the divisional away day a couple of years back on on histories historical aspects of, of medicine so some of you will know paul but for those that don't He's a historian of medicine and his academic work is now about the history of transplant surgery. He's worked with the VA uh, and looks to understand medicine, surgery as a craft, which the general public can then sort of feel involved with and understand how medicine and surgery might work at, at you know, a societal level. He's the author of uh, Spare Parts, a book which is just just arriving into Paul's hand, Surprising History of Transplant, which will be published right now. Uh, it's already been awarded special commendation in the Royal Society of Literature's Giles St. Albin Awards, and uh, his honorary position in the Department of Surgical Biotechnology and at the Science Museum as well as UCL, um, and he's a Science Museum Group Senior Research Associate. And he's working up with various members and colleagues and friends, including some of the Royal Free uh, Musical Project, which interprets uh, an artist artistic interface for medicine, surgery, and transplant activities. Again, spreading public information and public uh, engagement properties. So, Having said all those things, reminding people that the meeting is being recorded, I'll hand over to Paul now. Please go ahead, Paul. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, I'm just going to turn on my other camera. There we go. Because I've set up a. I'm, I'm trying out. I'm trying something out with some technology. <laughs> so I've got a camera to look into. Um, right. So before we start, I'd. Um, I'd like to say thank you, of course, to everyone for logging in uh, to listen to this talk and particularly, of course, to Chow uh, for organising it and to Barry for that uh, lovely introduction. Now, let's see, can I share my screen? Yes, I can. Good. So when I last had the privilege of speaking to you, it was, <coughs> excuse me, March 2020. It was just before the first lockdown and we talked about Alexei Carell and his perfection of vascular anastomosis and particularly how his technique was influenced by that of the French embroiderer uh, Marianne Leroudier. So before we start today's talk I want to say that I wrote that research up into a full-length article which has just got through the peer review process uh, and will be published in spring in the journal Configurations, which is a humanities journal. Uh, now that's quite a while away, so if you're if you're interested in, in any of the things that the article touches on, so things like uh, looking at surgery as a craft, uh, designing historical surgical reenactments, uh, the birth of organ transplants, or about Carell, or in Leroudier, Leroudier as an unacknowledged female professional in his world. And if you let me know or let Barry know uh, about that interest, then I'll be happy to send you the uh, article in advance of that publication. Now, I'll stop sharing the screen for a moment because I've not got a slide immediately. Uh, back to today then. Uh, today I want to talk to you about the horticultural origins of transplant surgery. So how far back do transplants actually go? And that was one of the first questions I asked myself when I was writing uh, the book Spare Parts that Barry mentioned. Uh, to find the answer to that question, I looked at the usual places, surgeons' memoirs, textbooks, articles, that kind of thing, 
and most sources, in fact, almost exclusively all sources, um, pointed to the early 20th century. In fact, to Carell's anastomosis uh, technique, uh, because that's when it became conceivable that an organ could be sewn, that one person's organ could be sewn into another person's body. If we look beyond organs, though, and think about transplants as any kind of surgical intervention that takes a body part from one place and moves it to another, transplants it, uh, then our timeline expands. And it expands by about 400 years into the past, obviously. And, and, and we find the first, the first um, we find that transplant surgery has a, a much fuller history than we're used to, to hearing about. So, for example, we find that the idea that transplants should save lives, which is, of course, something we more or less take for granted nowadays, that was an early 19th century invention. And before that, in the 18th century, we had the first markets in body parts. Then going back even further, another century, we find the first transfusions, and they were from animals to humans. Back even further than that, we reach the 16th century, and that's the time of uh, Suleiman the Magnificent. It's the time of Shakespeare, Copernicus, and all those um, Renaissance folk. Um, and it's also the time when the first modern skin grafts emerged in Italy. And this is the era when transplants resembled horticultural grafts. And also the time that they were um, part of Italian peasant culture. And in fact, transplanting skin was a, an alien concept to most medical professionals uh, until, well, the end of that century, the end of the 16th century. In fact, the very, very last years of the 16th century. So this talk is, is a story in three parts. The first is about the skin graft technique itself and its relationship to horticultural techniques. The second one is about the cultural context that skin graft emerged in. So basically how it emerged as a peasant's operation in mid 16th century Italy. And then finally, the last section, I want to talk a little bit about how skin grafting was finally adopted in conventional uh, university led uh, medicine and surgery. So if that's OK, we'll start and I'll share my screen again with part one. Um, I'd introduce the Vianio the family. I will in a minute, anyway. And the, the, the Vianio family were a, a family of surgeons um, in Tropea, which is a fishing village in Calabria. And actually, I found out on Wikipedia that they're also famous for red onions, which is very interesting. The Vianio family, anyway, they were uh, one of a few of a few surgical families uh, scattered around Italy. And in the 1540s, they were renowned for their special surgical technique to replace noses. So if you lost your nose, dueling or biting, or maybe you had syphilis or some disease that ate into that tissue, then you could ask these surgeons to make you a new nose. And they weren't the only family to perform that technique. I actually I found references to similar families performing skin grafts actually as far back as the, the 1460s in Italy. But the Vianio family, uh, that's a, their surgery deserves special attention, excuse me, because they were the last family to keep skin grafting a secret. But they didn't, they didn't really give it up uh, willingly. <laughs> they didn't intend for it to get out. Um, but one day they got a knock on the door um, from a man from Bologna. And this man asked them if they could, if he could watch them operate, you know, their, their technique being secret. He, they weren't so keen on this idea, but the man told them that his relative had lost his nose fighting in Lombardy. And um, he'd heard that these, this family of surgeons could um, could replace it for them. Uh, and in the end, they they let him watch. Um, and, but when they ushered him into the operating theatre, he told them that he didn't like blood. Uh, and as he watched, he put his hands up to his face uh, to cover his eyes, as if to sort of shield them from all this nastiness. But what the Vianio family surgeons didn't know was that the man was a fellow surgeon. I'll bring his picture up now. He's called Leonardo Fioravanti. Uh, 
and he'd made up this entire story about his relative and about not liking blood. He might have put his hands up to his eyes, but he was actually all the time looking very carefully through his splayed fingers because what he was really after was the secret skin grafting technique. Now, I won't describe what he saw in exhaustive detail, but basically, you cut a flap of skin out of a person's forearm, you make incisions around the place their nose would have been and will be in the future, <laughs> Uh, and then that creates two open wounds, and then you have to bind those together. And you do that by bringing the arm up to the nose area and shaping the flap that you've cut out of the arm around a nose-shaped mould and making sure those two open wounds touch. So after a few weeks, um, the surgeons can sever that connection between arm and face, and the patient can enjoy their new nose. There'll be pictures of this in a bit. Well, woodcuts, not actual pictures. Uh, but this procedure is basically the same for plants. You just substitute skin for bark. In fact, Fioravanti knew that these surgeons uh, were taking the many centuries old horticultural operation and simply transposing it to humans. In fact, for him, the connection between the operations, the human one and the plant one, was so strong but in one of his books, he described transplant surgery as the agriculture of the body. And in another one, he, he called it the farming of men. Now, a year after stealing this secret, Fioravanti, this chap, was on uh, the east coast of Tunisia. And he was walking along with a Spanish friend and a group of Ottoman soldiers. They were at war, Spain and Turkey. Um, they decided to pick a fight with him. And one of them lashed out his sword and sliced into this Spanish friend's face. And Fioravanti described what he saw. He described his friend's nose dropping into the dirt and rolling in, in some sand. And he saw the blood start to well up from the gap where his nose used to be. And he picked it up and, to use Fioravanti's own words, pissed on it. Having pissed on this nose to wash away the sand, he, he, he stuck this urine-soaked nose onto his friend's face and bound it there in the manner he'd learnt a year earlier. Uh, but when he untied the and when he untied the bandage, um, his nose his nose was attached again. And in fact, when he wrote about this many years, I think it was about thirty years later, twenty odd uh, thirty years later, he said that if his, if his readers didn't believe him, they could ask his friend who was alive and well. Um, and it's I, I don't quite believe him. You can make up your own mind. Although we can't ask the friend at the moment. Um, anyway, that's the technique. Um, the, the plant and human grafts very, very similar. Before I move on to part two, I want to mention very briefly, just in passing, that skin grafting is actually much, much older than this. In fact, it's mentioned in the Sushruta Samhita, which is an Ayurvedic surgical text written in the 6th century uh, BC. Uh, it's, it, it, also, it also covers what would become uh, caesarean sections and, and how to perform cataract surgery, actually, that text. It's, it's, very, it's a very interesting read. Um, but th in this talk, we're talking about modern transplant. Uh, but I thought I'd mention that older operation because it has, because um, it probably has agricultural origins, although we can't, we can't really, um, there's, there's no documentation to back that up. It's just a, sus a suspicion Anyway, this is where I'm transitioning from that first part of the talk to the second about the cultural context. And I'll stop showing my screen for a moment, so hopefully you can see me again. Uh, the main point I want to make in this part of the talk is that the agriculture of the body, as Fioravanti called it, was not only ingenious, it was also intuitive. And by that, I mean that people at the time seem to have had a much deeper appreciation of their relationship with trees and plants and even thought about themselves in some ways as physiologically similar to them. So, for example, classical philosophers and historians, uh, Pliny, Pliny the Elder, for example, he, he wrote about how trees have the equivalence of flesh, skin, sinews, veins, bones and marrow. I think I've got them all. 
Uh, their bark also ages just like human skin. It sags and wrinkles and so on. Um, these were you know, fairly well-known uh, parallels. Aristotle even saw a continuum between plants and animals. They weren't completely separate, as did Galen. When, when either of them wrote about digestion, they wrote about it as if it was a process of transforming plant into human. So you, you eat plants and that matter then becomes bits of you through the digestion process. And Aristotle and Galen were two of the most important classical thinkers whose ideas, I mean, it's, it's, it's a slight exaggeration to say that their ideas were responsible for shaping Western culture at the time, but not, not that much of an exaggera exaggeration. And in fact, they were, they were very, very influential right up until the 18th century, especially in medicine. So in this sense, skin grafting in 16th century Italy represents one way amongst a number of ways that humans saw themselves in a, a loosely horticultural, agricultural context. It's also significant that Fioravanti found the operation performed in a little fishing village because Fioravanti valued nature above everything and, and, and the people who lived amongst it, he valued those as well. In fact, in all of his books, he encouraged doctors to look to nature for answers to medical and surgical problems. He wrote um, that they should keep away from books, actually, presumably apart from his books, which they should buy and sell, um, because they should be looking for a natural way of healing. And Fioravanti himself travelled all over the place, over land and sea, actually, to seek out distillers and shepherds and soldiers and uh, old wise women, anyone, actually, anyone with a peasant heritage who might be able to teach him something from the land. So one person he came across in Sicily was an a hundred uh, was a hundred and four year old man, and this chap he insisted that every summer he took a particular herb that made him vomit, and that this was the secret to his old age. He said he couldn't get sick after that for the whole year, and Fioravanti thought that this worked because he'd seen it happen with dogs in the wild. They also. He saw them find herbs to make themselves sick and out of out of this realization this natural way of healing he invented some new medicines and he sold them as far away as elizabethan england and he was um, mainly sort of in the italy region of italy um and the, the skin graft is a bit like this vomiting man in that it's rustic knowledge practiced only by the people and em emphatically not by professional doctors. In fact, even the great anatomist Andreas Vesalius described the skin graft as having something to do with grafting muscle, which would be impossible. And it, and it showed that he, he didn't understand this way of, of, of relating to the body and healing. And for Fioravanti, it confirmed his suspicions that university people are obsessed with books are obsessed with arguing with one another at the expense of common sense and at the expense of hands-on healing that actually worked, that he could show worked, or he said he could show worked, at least. So this is the um, second way that transplants had or horticultural origins, as it were. The first is the technique, of course, um, which is very similar to the horticultural technique, and the second one is grafting was part of a, a culture that, that valued trees uh, and even a culture where people saw themselves and their bodies and their bodily processes to an extent reflected in trees and plants. And as well as that, it was uh, skin grafting was a, a practice only for communities that lived closest to and cultivated nature. So we're moving on to part three now. So this is about how transplantation finally became a university subject. Now, I mentioned that skin grafting didn't have a place in universities in the middle of the 16th century, and I've, I've given you some reasons for that. Uh, but this, is, this had changed by the 1580s because Fioravanti put it there himself, which is a bit strange, really, because um, a bit surprising, rather, because he famously detested excuse me, university man and anything to do with reading. Uh, but this is how it happened. Let's see if I've uh, got a 
image coming up in a minute. Uh, somewhere along the line, uh, Fioravanti made friends with a man called Giulio Cesare Aranzio. And he was the chair of anatomy at Bologna University. And actually, Fioravanti did graduate from Bologna University, although he didn't act like uh, a standard doctor or surgeon. Um, as a, anyway, as I said, Fioravanti didn't usually make friends in the university world, but Aranzio somehow caught his attention. And Fioravanti even wrote that he was so skillful that he, and this is a quote, almost brings the dead back to life when he lays hands on them. And towards the end of Fioravanti's life, he taught Aranzio how to graft skin. And then Fioravanti died in 1588. Um, and then his friend claimed to have invented skin grafting himself. And he called himself in his book, the first restorer of noses and ears. That's, an, that's another quote. Uh, but then he died a year later. So he didn't get to enjoy that glory for long. But luckily... He taught that technique to one of his students, and this is a man you might have heard of. He was called Ta uh, Gaspare Tagliacozzi, and I'm going to go back to my presentation now, because I've got some pictures you might also have seen. It's, it's uh, Tagliacozzi's book, by the way, that gets pulled out ev every time anyone talks about plastic surgery, because this, of course, knows jobs. <laughs> it's, it's, graf it's skin grafting, but it's also considered by many the birth of, tra of, of um, plastic surgery and uh, cosmetic surgery. So these pictures are from 1597 and they depict that skin graft that Fioravanti stole a few decades earlier. The one that I relayed in a sort of a in similar terms to Fioravanti did when he wrote, wrote it down. Uh, so that's how skin grafting came to be written about by a university man for the, for the first time. Now, when he took his readers through the new technique, he also drew comparisons with the cultivation of trees. But Tagliacozzi seems to have been occupied by another question. And that question was, are these nose jobs natural? What he was worried about was one of the perennial problems that you know, many surgeons and scientists still encounter from people um, in relation to their discipline, especially biotechnologists today. And that was, was skin grafting tantamount to playing God? Now, we know this is a question that was important to Tagliacozzi because his book was enormous. But it's only the very last few pages that has anything to do with the operation itself. The rest of it was about the perfection of the human face and how important it was to maintain the perfection of the, of the human face. He's got some handy images, uh, handy diagrams to show you what a perfect nose looks like, its perfect dimensions. And he talked about how important it is to keep these features aligned and, and in order to sort of give his, his ideas on beauty some credibility and some weight in that Renaissance context, in that Renaissance um, academic world. He drew on classical thinkers and theologians, you know, Aristotle, Horace, St. Augustine. And at the time, questions like what is natural and what is artificial, they were very much alive questions in Italian Renaissance culture. As it happens, Horticulturalists and gardeners also pose the same questions about their own grafts and their other creations in the gardening realm, as it were. The challenge they felt they faced was coming up with a way to describe something that wasn't quite artificial, but it wasn't quite natural either. You know, something that had been created by nature, but manipulated by human hands and not for agricultural purposes, not for a, a useful end. Uh, some people, they call this natural artifice. Other people called it artificial nature. And there was another term as well, uh, third nature. And that ref that referred to a classical understanding of first nature as the wilderness, second nature as 
uh, useful agricultural uh, things, landscaping for agriculture, for um, um, productive purposes. And the third nature is something between the two. And that's the reason, actually, that many Italian Renaissance gardens have sculptures of monsters like these in them. They represent the fact that gardens themselves were considered abominations because gardening and horticulture presumes to impose another order on an already divinely ordered world. Or at least that's according to the writer Luke Morgan, who's written a lot about Renaissance gardens. On behalf of surgeons, though, Talia Cozzi had to address those very same questions. So his book is long because he hoped to convince his readers that he was restoring equilibrium and beauty, restoring the perfect human face and nose. It was a surgeon's duty to restore that divine order when something had disrupted, disrupted it, like disease, uh, accident, uh, punishment, something like that. And hopefully by the time the readers got to Fioravanti's description of the operation, uh, Telecopsy's description of the operation, hopefully they would, re they would agree. Now, a lot rested on, on them agreeing because the alternative was that the surgeon was actively distorting God's image and inviting chaos out of the order. Now, that might sound a bit dramatic to say that the alternative to thinking a surgeon was restoring a face was to believe that he was inviting chaos. I mean, it's, it's a bit, it sounds a bit extreme. But it's, it's not really an exaggeration. It's hard to appreciate nowadays how credible it was that a disruption to the natural order might bring about unknown and unpredictable consequences. The stories of Ovid um, were, were very popular back then. They still are, actually. Uh, and they, they showed the extent uh, of the chaos uh, that could emerge when flesh is no longer a boundary between two beings. So one thing could transform into another if order if a natural order breaks down and it's it's no coincidence actually that the monsters that populate many italian renaissance gardens are drawn directly from ovid's stories this is the story of mira who turned into a myrrh tree and gave birth to adonis um but anyway it's, it's with it's with talia Cozzi that the story of skin grafting ends at least for my book it, it does continue obviously uh, the story of transplants continues of course in fact it was just 40 years or so later when transfusionists in britain and france performed the first transfusions between animals and humans we don't have time to talk about that today because i think i'm coming up to half an hour now anyway um but the first transfusionists uh, turned their scalpels towards the first sorry the first the human the first transfusionists turned their scalpels towards the first human recipients for animal blood and when they did that they hoped they could violate nature and they actually drew on Ovid's stories for inspiration so if you if you could transfuse young blood a person might become young for some reason, a man called George Acton thought if you transfuse cat's blood, you could cure epilepsy. And surprisingly, a lot of people, or a comparatively a lot of people, uh, thought that a transfusion of cow's blood or lamb's blood might make the recipient start to moo or grow wool. But that's another story. Um, but it's a story, actually, one of many you can read about if you're interested. <laughs> in spare parts um and that's where i'll end thank you very much